in a sense, the EU is keeping up what they promised two, two years ago. And that sounds really not particularly exciting and interesting at all. I understand Kiev. But if you see it from the EU side and the problems, the internal problems the EU have had to come at least to this agreement, especially with the Dutch, um, it is something that Ukraine eventually will be somewhat happy about. What is the Dutch position on Ukraine's European integration, given the recent referendum where the majority rejected it? They had to, in December 2016, here in the Council, put up with that sort of supplement to the uh, Ukrainian Association Agreement, which allowed the Netherlands to ratify the agreement earlier this year. And uh, the Netherlands basically insisted that there should be a reference to this uh, addendum to the Association Agreement. Uh, and the reason for that is simply that partly because they take this referendum seriously and you can't take that away from them. This is they take that seriously and secondly because Ukraine, uh, sorry, Netherlands until very recently haven't had a government. So they were basically sticking with their old lines all the time. Maybe with this new government that is very fresh, it's one month old, Ukraine and the Netherlands can work out a better relationship. But at the moment, this is the Dutch position and uh, Ukraine have to somehow accept that, even if it sucks, to put it out mildly. In general, what do you think should be Ukraine's goals in cooperation with the European Union now? Because the visa regime is already there, the association agreement is already there, and sometimes Ukrainian officials say that they want more, like all this talk about the Eastern Partnership Plus Forum. Yeah, yeah. I think, well, the main reason I think why Ukraine accepted the aspirations language even though it was not particularly good is that what I understand from Mr. Poroshenko's meeting with Mr. Juncker last night is that Mr. Poroshenko has got a sort of promise from the EU or the European Commission that the European Commission will look into what is called a feasibility study for Ukraine to see if Ukraine can join sometime in the future the customs union, the digital union and the energy union. Now these three projects, if Ukraine can join, will be something that Ukraine really can work on in the future as well. I would add within the digital union one thing that I think can be something that Ukrainian government but also business can work on is to lower, lower or perhaps even abolish roaming charges between uh, Ukraine and the European Union. That's another thing that is very tangible for, I think, people. Before the summit, EU officials, Commissioner Hahn was saying that before coming to the next level of cooperation, Eastern Partnership countries should first implement what is already there, and he stressed the importance of implementing the commitments taken, in particular by Ukraine, in terms of fighting corruption. They, I understand always when I speak to them that they are frustrated. That's the word they use. We are frustrated. You know, they are not remo their reforms are not going fast enough. But in the same time, they always say, "But they understand that this is a huge issue uh, for two reasons mainly. That uh, one is that Ukraine is still in a war, and we have to accept that. That all the resources can't go to fight corruption because." there is a, a real aggressor on, on the Eastern Front that is bothering Ukraine. So, of course, that is a problem. Uh, the second issue is as well that, yes, Ukraine, so the EU can lecture Ukraine about corruption, but only so much. We have several very corrupt countries inside the European Union as well. So the EU is perhaps not always the best teacher when it comes to this as well. What in general do you think about the future of the Eastern Partnership? Because in recent years there was a growing gap between the two groups of countries inside the Eastern Partnership. Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova on one hand, you have visa-free regime and association agreements, and Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, who have a very low scale level of cooperation with the EU compared to others. Do you think Eastern Partnership should be reformatted in some way, maybe split in two? That's exactly what I think. Uh, I know that I'm in some sort of minority that everyone here, at least officials, say that oh, we should go on with some partnership. I don't really see the reason for that anymore. I think there should be a, a GUM summit or a MUG summit, Moldova, Ukraine, Georgia, Georgia, Ukraine, Moldova, whatever you want to put it. Those three countries should have um, maybe individual summits. Ukraine already has that, but as, a, as associated partner countries summit or something like that. I don't really think it makes sense for these six countries to be together anymore in this format. It's simply like there are three countries 
that eventually wants to become members of this club and there are three countries that have no interest whatsoever. Uh, it doesn't make sense for these three countries to be to, six countries to be together anymore. I can then name at least 20 things that the EU that keeps EU officials awake at night. Eastern Partnership is for sure not one of them. Right now, it's all about getting the economy going again, Brexit, managing still the potential migration crisis, and then working out the next EU budget. That's about the things they're going to think about. Uh, not even Russia and the threat of Russia is particularly high on the agenda anymore. Uh, I mean, you can just look at the, the summit here today. Did Macron come? Did Rutte come? Uh, no. And when you saw the foreign press, I'm not talking now about uh, Eastern Partnership press, the other press of the other EU member states, when they asked questions to their respective leaders, they didn't talk about the Eastern Partnership.